with it? <laughs> Down through eternity, eternity, uh, he figured a plan, and there's only one way, there's always only been one way. Uh, in his infinite wisdom, his way was always the right way. Uh, you get in his way or you don't get in his way, it's really your choice. Take your Bibles. Last week I preached on getting back in the boat. Sometimes getting in a boat, uh, if you've ever been in the boat and you get out of the boat, uh, getting the courage to get back in the boat uh, is tough. It's just tough. Uh, I don't know, you tell people that and they, they don't understand it, but it's, I know a lot of guys who's been in the battle, and, and in the battle they, something happened to them and they uh, got shell-shocked, whatever it was, man, the battle. But to get back in that battle is tough. And you have to overcome some things in your life to do that. Uh, and so I'm sitting there, I was reading that story, and I said, Lord, it's a great uh, passage. I love that story about the, uh, Jesus going across the waters and the disciples and the boats and all that other stuff and the waves and, and exactly what, it, he that go down the sea in ships. I mean, you go down there, there's things that happen on a ship that doesn't happen in the ocean. In the ocean itself, there's things that happen that just don't happen anywhere else. And you get to see some things that normally you wouldn't see in other places, and those men got to see some things. And Lord opened their eyes to a man that there was across the water there that there was a, a, a divine moment in life that Jesus was going to be there in front of that maniac. That, set, that, that point was set. There was no way out of that thing. The Lord didn't want out of that thing. The maniac was going to be there. Jesus was going to be there. His disciples were going to be there. They were all going to learn some stuff when that thing went on. And Jesus was going to get a man and turn his life around. It wasn't going to be the same after he got done. There's one thing I like about the maniac. I mentioned some of that, and I'll mention it here in a few minutes. The maniac was a maniac. There was no doubt in your mind that this guy was a maniac. This guy was on this side over here. This is where he was. He was in the tombs cutting himself. You couldn't chain him up. You couldn't do nothing. You couldn't hold him. That's where he was. He gets, he gets converted prior to this cross. I know you're prior to the cross here. But he gets, he gets the devils cast out of him. And he's way over here on the other side. There's no middle ground there, by the way. Jesus Christ just gave you the perfect example. This is you when you got started. This is how you're supposed to be when it's done. This took place in moments. Not years. Moments. In our life, maybe, maybe in a couple hours. And you got a guy sitting over here ready to follow Jesus anywhere he goes. You know what's wrong with most of us? You're still like right here in the middle. You're playing this little game in the middle like you're the hot shot. You're not the hot shot. Neither am I. Nobody is. We're not it, man. We're not it. It's about Jesus. Take your Bibles. Go to Mark 5, uh, 5 17. That's a great passage, man. You could, I was talking to Brother Steve a few months ago. The Bible's in layers. I mean, it's layer after layer after layer after layer. Uh, uh, where I went to Bible college, yet the guy, uh, Dr. Rutman, said, he, he said, you hold this book. He goes, uh, he said, I, it wouldn't surprise him. If, if you could not read this book this way, I mean, uh, you close the book, and if you could see the pages, read it this way, and this way, and this way, and that way, and every which way. He said God is an, a, a, a multidimensional man, creature. He's not a creature. He's God. He's not like us. His ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. It has heaven above the earth. So far as his thoughts above our thoughts, uh, he can do it any way he wants. And he puts something down here where meager man in a three-dimensional world can grasp that thing and read it. But in God's world, it's totally different. It never was this way. And we have, we have corrupted the thing, like he said. Our minds have corrupted the thing. Mark 5, 17 says this. And they began to pray him to depart out of their coast. A bunch of wicked devils, man. They don't want to hear it anymore. And when he was come into the ship, uh, he, had, he that had been possessed with the devils prayed him that he might uh, be with him. You see the calmness of this man? Uh, his mind is there. He, he knows exactly what he wants to do. Howbeit, Jesus suffered him not, but saith unto him, Go home to thy friends. Tell them how great things the Lord had done for thee, and hath compassion on thee. And he departed and began to publish into the capitalists and how, how great things Jesus had done for him, and all men did marvel. Father, thank you for your blessings this morning. Uh, Lord, simple little message here about a, a man, Lord, that you had an effect in his life. Uh, Lord, I just thank you for that. Uh, bless those that are here this morning, those that's watching. Uh, Lord, I just pray that you'd give us something out of the precious word of God, and we'll praise you and honor you in Jesus' precious holy name. Amen. 
Uh, this man was sitting there in a tomb all by himself, not, not, I mean, miserable, crying, cutting himself day after day after day after day after day for however long he was up there, possessed with 2,000, at least the legion is at least 2,000 uh, devils, possessed with all those devils, uh, constantly his mind's running. Could you imagine having a body with a mind and everything's just rushing and rushing and rushing inside your brain and you can't keep it, you can't grab hold of any thought, you're always fighting to hold it and, and all the devils are sitting there, 2,000 voices going on in your head plus yours, 2001. That's a space odyssey, by the way. That's messed up. Oliver Green, Oliver Green said something one time, a famous, famous old, 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 old preacher. He said, there is a thin line, a thin red line that runs through your old, the Old Testament and is a picture of the precious blood of Jesus Christ. All the way through your Bible, if you go back into Genesis chapter 1, 2, and 3, you'll find a, a couple there, Adam and Eve, uh, created perfect. If you want what normal is, if you want to try to make your life normal, then go back to Genesis 1, 2, and 3, look at Adam in the Garden of Eden, him and Eve, and in a sinless state, that's normal. To God. Anything past them biting that fruit is abnormal. Anything. From that day to right now, the whole world's abnormal. You know what our problem is? Is you continue, it's like those devils in our head. The maniac of Gadara. We're trying to make the world normal. You can't make it normal. It's abnormal. Only one person will ever make this normal, and it'll be Revelation 21 when he burns the place up and starts all over again. Then it will be normal. But even in the tribulation, after the tribulation, in the millennial reign of Jesus Christ, it won't be normal as per se what it was in Genesis chapter 1, 2, and 3. It won't be that way. As a matter of fact, heaven was created, and it was not normal because of the moment Satan sinned, it messed that all up. Anything that's created... And as long as you get this in your mind and you, you can reconcile it in your mind and heart, you can live through this thing. Anything that is created can mess up. So if you hold somebody to a standard out here somewhere, that's foolish. Because what you just did is you set somebody up on high that, that is a created thing that can mess up. Everybody messes up. Maybe but us. You know, sometimes we think we don't. <laughs> right, right. Right. There's a thin line, thin red line that runs through the Old Testament. It starts with Adam and Eve, and it go, then it continues on with the lamb. Abel, Abel offered a lamb. You know, Adam and Eve, Adam and Eve, uh, after they sinned, didn't know what to do. They were hidden behind a bush. You know, a bush won't, won't cover your sin. A couple leaves here and there, clothes won't cover your sin. Uh, you need something, you need the blood of Jesus Christ to cover your sin, but guess what? He hadn't died on the cross yet. That's 4,000 years down the road. You know what God did? He took an innocent lamb in the Garden of Eden, or an animal, but I believe it's a lamb. He killed that lamb. He skinned those skins off that thing, shed the blood in the Garden of Eden, took those skins and covered Adam and Eve and covered their sins. Didn't do away with it. He just covered it. It starts right there. Then Abel. They have a boy named Abel. And Abel has a brother named Cain. And Cain gets mad because Abel offers what God told him to offer because that's what his mommy and daddy said. And then uh, Cain didn't want to do that. Uh, Gary Duty has a song, uh, you can't get blood from a turnip. You can't. Uh, God requires a blood, the life of the flesh. Levit Leviticus 17, 11 says the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon an altar to make an atonement for your soul, for it's the blood that makes an atonement. Nothing else will work. All through your Bible, that's exactly what it is. It's the blood. It's the blood. It's the blood. It's the blood. Cain made his offering. Uh, Abel made his offering. Cain got mad, killed Abel. Uh, it's evident that the offering that Noah made when he came out of the ark after God killed everybody on the planet, except Noah, his wife, three boys, and three girls. Uh, it was three daughter-in-laws. Genesis 8.20 says, and Noah built an altar. It would do us good, some of us, to build an altar. You need an altar right there in your heart, man. There's, you, that's where the thing needs to be, right there. Uh, the altar of your soul. You need, you need something right there where you can get a hold of God. You know what's wrong with a lot of people? They don't know how to get a hold of God no more. And Noah built an altar unto the Lord and took of every clean beast and every clean fowl and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And the Lord smelled a sweet savor. You know what the Lord does when you get that thing right? He smells a sweet savor, man. I like that, man. I like that. Then you get down to, uh, it, it, it was unveiled, unveiled by the, uh, the ram in the thickets with Abraham. Abraham's up at the side of the mountain with his son. He's going to kill him. 
People say, why would you do that? Because God said it. Who cares? I don't care what you think. Somebody told me how to get the sign, Israeli sign off our sign. I ain't going to do it. Well, you need to be fair. I don't have to be fair. What you think fair is and what God thinks fair is two different fairs. He sits there, that's God's land. Get off of it. I'm not on it. You know why I'm not on it? Because it don't belong to me. It's God's land. And he goes, this guy said, well, you need to put a Palestinian flag up on you. If you get mad, I don't care. You need to put a Palestinian flag up on your sign. No, I don't. It's a private sign. I don't owe you nothing. Well, you're just a mean pastor. You got it, man. I'm on God's side. You think I'm mean. Wait till he gets a hold of you. <laughs> Man, I read this book. I read it all the time. And when I look at it, he, when he gets, I don't, you don't ever want to mess with an angel. Everybody wants these little angels. You got your little angel on your Christmas tree on Christmas time with little wings and stuff. That's not an angel. Angels are somebody you do not want to even mess with. You do not want to get them involved in your life. You don't want them nowhere around you. As a matter of fact, if you got angels at your house, you ought to go home and take them out and throw them in the trash can and get rid of them. You don't want them guys anywhere around. And they're men, by the way. They're not women. Angels just, they're one set track mind. Kill. Or whatever God says do. If he says go down and talk to somebody, I'll go down and talk to him. I'll go talk to Mary. Gabriel said, yeah, I'll go talk to Mary. Mary's a cool girl. I'll go talk to her. She's sweet. I can talk to Mary. Why? Because the Lord told me to talk to you. Zacchaeus, Zacharias, you ask one wrong question, you're going to shut your mouth for nine months. You, you, bro, I'm telling you what, angel, and David, you numbered the people. All you did was went out and did a census. Uh, y'all ever want to hear that guy down in Cincinnati, the uh, uh, senseless survey? <laughs> Gary Burbank or whoever the guy was. I forget who the guy was. But he would call people up, and this is a senseless survey. And it would be a senseless conversation that he'd have with the senseless people that would listen to the senseless survey. Crazy thing. It was unveiled by the ram in the thickets. Abraham, Abraham got up on the side of that mountain, and the Lord said, take your son up there, kill him, kill, out, kill, kill Isaac. He didn't say, God, that's my only son, man. What, what's up with this? Can you tell me? No. He said, okay, give me, you get a couple donkeys together, a couple men, heads out, goes up on the side of the mountain, got ready to kill it. The Lord said, no, stop, and there's a ram in the thicket, and he pulls the ram out. And that blood is still shed for, for his son Isaac and him. Moses goes into uh, Egypt to get him out. And at the very end of that thing, he said, I'm going to bring the last plague through this thing. And when I do, every firstborn of every man, every child, every, every, could you, the generations of firstborns dying. If there was a great, 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 great grandfather alive, then he, if he was the firstborn, he died. His firstborn son would die. His son's firstborn son would die. His son's sons all the way down until every firstborn person died, animal, beast, and man. But if you had the blood on the door, if you killed an innocent lamb and put that blood on the door, guess what? He passed over you. Oliver Reed Green's absolutely right. There is a thin red line that travels through your Bible. And it, you hang right there where that blood is. And it's the blood of Jesus Christ that cleanses all sins. David found it. Uh, Jesus. Oh, man, the, the final payment was secured at Calvary when our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ shed his blood, precious blood. Now, the maniac is sitting here prior to the cross. So the maniac did not get saved per se as you and I did. He was not looking to the cross. He never even knew. He was a maniac. He didn't have no idea the cross was getting. He was a maniac. You know what a maniac is? Is an unsaved person. I've seen a lot of people saved act like maniacs. The sinner, the maniac, when Jesus found the maniac. Jesus planned personally to go find this maniac. The apostles did not plan to go find the maniac. They just got in the boat with Jesus. Jesus went purposely to go see that maniac. Why? Because that maniac, Jesus, the Bible says that Christ came to seek and Luke came to seek and save that which was lost. He would go through a storm to get to you, if that's what it took to get to you, to get you saved. He will do whatever he has to do to get you saved. That's what he does. And what so many times what you do, we miss that thing. When Jesus found the maniac, the maniac was a sinner. He was retained and restrained. He was retained by those 2,000, the legion of devils that was in him, 
that he was restrained by them. He was cutting himself. He was locked into what he was doing all the time. He couldn't get out of it. He was in a rut. He couldn't get out of the thing. There was no way out of that thing. Crying and weeping all the time up there in the thing. He, you know what he was? That, he was a religious man. Did you ever think about that? The maniac was religious. You know, there's a lot of people sitting in church that are religious. They're maniacs. They're religious. They're just religious. You say, how do you say it? He responds correctly to Jesus. Verse 6, it says, but when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshipped him. You know, a maniac knows how to worship God. There's, there's people that are lost that know the right thing to do. I've talked to a lot of Christian, men, men and women down through history. They know all about Jesus. They know all kinds of stuff. But when it comes right down to the nitty-gritty, they, they haven't a clue who Jesus really is. This man here, he responded correctly. As a matter of fact, he identified Jesus positively. Verse 7 says, And cried with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou son of the most high God? He got that thing, he nailed that thing right to the a maniac, a lost, hell-bound, demonic, Satan-filled man got that thing right. So we got a lot of people in church that way. Let me ask you a question. Are you that way today? Are you a maniac? Or are you what Jesus wants? You know what Jesus, he found the maniac. You know what Jesus wanted to do? He wanted to find the maniac. It wasn't that he just accidentally fell upon the maniac. He knew, knew right where the maniac is. You know what he knew? The maniac needed him. You know what the maniac knew? The maniac knew he needed Jesus. You know what the problem with a lot of people is? You don't know that you need God. You need him every hour. Every hour of your life, every moment of your life, you need God in your life. You need the Lord Jesus Christ in your life. You need the Holy Spirit guiding and directing your steps. Amen. He that hath friends must show himself friendly. You got friends? If you ain't got no friends, a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. If your friend is Jesus Christ, you should have friends. Why? Because there's a lot of people who believe Jesus Christ. Man, you guys are all my friends, man. Could we be better Christians? Of course we could. Could we love Jesus more? Of course we And one day we all will. But until then, guess what? We're stuck with each other. Well, maybe you're just stuck with me. I don't know. I don't, you know, it's, it's, I, nobody's ever tried to get rid of me yet. But I'm at a point in life where I don't really care. I mean, you know, I, I was talking to somebody the other day, and, uh, and I, I don't care what life brings hardly anymore. It just doesn't matter. I mean, I, I've done this thing for 43, 44 years with Jesus Christ. It just doesn't matter. I've watched him get me through things that only he could get me through. I've watched him walk with me when it was just me and him and nobody else and me crying like a baby, and he got me through that, and I knew what right was, and I knew what I wanted to do wasn't right, and what Jesus said to do was right, and I followed what he said to do, and it worked out right. You know, he'll send flags up all the time in your life if you'll listen. Great peace have them that love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. You know what will happen if you, you do the, everything will be peaceful if you're actually doing what you, I mean, it could be tribulation, turmoil all over the place, but you'll have peace right here. You know when that peace right there goes away? That's telling you God's not in that thing. It's the flesh, it's the world, the flesh, or the devil, one of the three. Or Jesus Christ, or the Holy Spirit. And you get these three going, man, and you can't hardly tell the difference. You can't. You know if Satan stood here today and Jesus Christ stood right next to him, there's not a man or woman in this room that would be able to tell the difference. You know why? Because they both look angelic. Both of them. But you hear Jesus talk for a couple seconds and you hear the devil talk and you'd pick that thing right out. You know what that is? Great peace have them that love thy law. Peace. Peace and joy are the key to this walk in the Christian life. He tells you over in 1 John, he said, he gives you a way to get rid of your sin if you confess your sins, he's faithful. But why? Verse 4, that your joy may be full. You know, if you're not joyful, there's something wrong in your heart. Not the person next to you, not the person down the street, not your, the family, not the, you. There isn't nobody can take my joy. Not a single person on the face of this planet can take my joy. You can make me miserable. You can make me mad. You can't take my joy. I've been locked up in places, man, where I'm sitting there just laughing. Just happy as I could be, man. 
on the middle of the, in the middle of the ocean on a ship out there just sailing down the road, everybody else on the ship, miserable. I'm sitting there going, yeah, underway, man. Underway, underway, love underway, get underway. People say, you're crazy. Why? I got three years. That's all I got to do on this ship. Three years, you start counting. Tick, 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 tick. It's gone. After three years, I'm gone. I've got this much time to figure out what this thing is and enjoy it. And I ain't going to waste the time for nobody, man. I'm going to have fun. You know what I did? I figured out what that thing was and had fun. Wherever you're at, there you are. You know, have you ever figured that thing out? You ought to have fun doing whatever you're doing or go do something else. If you're doing something and you're miserable, you got a problem. This guy's miserable. When Jesus found the maniac, he was miserable. But you know what? That guy could respond correctly. He identified Jesus positively. We're talking to maniac now. And he was still bound by sin. So many people, you talk to them and they say, oh, I know Jesus, and they're bound by sin. I know who the Lord is, and you just hear it in their voice. I go, are you saved? I'm saved. Why would you ask that? That's weird. I said, ask me that. <laughs> are you saved? Yes, man, I got saved in 1980 on the back porch of Louisville, Kentucky. Ah, are you saved? I said, why is the answer different? The greatest thing that could ever happen to you, why would you be bitter about it when you say something to a brother or sister in Christ? What in the world's wrong with us, man? I have no idea. But that sinner was still bound, Mark 5, 2 says, immediately they met him out of the tombs of man with an unclean spirit. You know, I think saved people can be possessed. I really do, man. I've seen some saved people that just don't even act right. I mean, you, you can't make everybody be what you are. They just aren't going to be what you are. Because you're a unique thing. You know what the Lord did? He made a whole bunch of people and he taught you how to live with them. You ought to live with them, man. Me, me and Beth, we, I laugh all the time. You hear me talk all the time about her bringing me coffee. The other day she did it. And, and she's laughing. She's looking at her, man. Y'all, I wish the camera was up here looking at her face. She's laughing. She said, you want a cup of coffee? She comes down to my office and asks me if I want a cup of coffee. I said, yes, I know what this means. <laughs> Forget it. You ain't get a cup of coffee. She should say, you don't want a cup of coffee. Then I'd get one in about 30 seconds. But she cut, and then she goes away. Well, I've got my phones all set up with intercoms in them, so all over the house. I've got a phone so I can hit the button and, and get her. So I know she's there somewhere, so I'll ring the button. And she'll, oh, an hour later. Oh, do you still want that cup of coffee? <laughs> I said, yes. She said, don't you tell anybody I said this. <laughs> I said, hey, I got this coffee cup says, if you say anything to the pastor, it's going to be in a sermon. <laughs> I did have a hat up here somewhere that said that same thing, but it, it's just the way it works, man. It just comes out of there. For the Son of Man came to seek and save, save that which was lost. That guy had been bound with fetters. He was still in sin. He'd been bound with fetters and chains, and he, he, he could tear that stuff apart. He's always up there day and night in the mountains, in the tombs, crying and cutting himself with stone, just... Just broken. I mean, broken. You know, the Lord out of heaven, over the bowels of heaven, looked down and seen that man. Knew, knew right where that man was. He watched the day the first devil entered that man. And whatever that guy did to do that, uh, I think the first two or three, uh, he, he, he did what he did. And, and the rest of them just came afterwards to hang out with their brother, fellow devils or whatever. Uh, but so many times we do stuff in our lives to invite Satan right into it. And then we'll try to blame something else. And it's not something else. It's that. It's that. It's right there. You let the thing in. You let the wickedness in. We're in a world today that is so stinking wicked that no matter which way you turn, you're getting yourself involved in something you shouldn't probably be involved in. If you stayed home, shut everything off, and lived in your house and did absolutely nothing, you'd probably be okay. Maybe. I doubt it, but you probably could. I was reading, uh, seeing a documentary the other day. They said that 5G and all the radio signals coming in, your body's all working on circuitry. You got electronics, electrical stuff going through your body all the time. All these different radar waves and microwaves are front. You put an egg in a microwave. You ever put an egg in a microwave? Don't ever put an egg in a microwave. Not in the shell, anyways. I've tried it a couple times. I can't figure out a way. There's got to be a way to do it that it doesn't just go boom. Some of y'all must have done that because I see you laughing. But I mean, it's just like egg everywhere in the in the thing. Well, you got a microwave, and guess what? By the way, oh, just to let you know, just to let you know, young ladies. You ever wonder why your, your brains don't act right? You ever wonder why people put pins and stuff in their nose and this way and that way? That is a microwave generator. A little bit less power than your microwave. And you stick that to your head. You know why I don't talk on that thing? You stick that to your head and you're cooking your brain. Then you do this. And you're frying your eyeballs. 
It's either brain or eyeballs. I guess your eyeballs would be better because at least you have a brain to think. But that guy was up there night and day, just night and day in misery and in misery and in torment inside his life. He got to a place in his life where the thing had been built up and built up and built up. Now there's 2,000 devils and a legion. They said a legion. A legion could be uh, 6,000, minimum two. This guy had a legion in him. I mean a legion. Could you, you can't, we can't even imagine that. You know why the Lord says keep clean? So that don't happen to you. Then if you do, it does happen and you recognize it happens, you got a way out. When Jesus met the maniac, the maniac was in sin. The maniac was just messed up. But when the maniac met Jesus, things changed. The sinner was rescued and released and redeemed. Now, it's before the cross. I got that. But boy, that man, man, I mean, he, he was in his right mind. Now, this isn't the message yet. I'm getting to the message here in just a second. This is just a story. He was in his right mind. Mark 15, 5, or 5.15 says, And they came to Jesus and seen him possessed with the devils, and uh, he had a legion and had the legion sitting and clothed in his right mind. Uh, they were afraid. You know what? Uh, when, he, when that guy got right, he, he was redeemed. Uh, a redeemed man, number one, a redeemed man should be in his right mind. Jesus gives you a perfect example right there. The moment Jesus casts the devils out of your life, you should be in your right mind. I don't care what, 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 I don't care. I don't care what your conditions are, life is, it doesn't matter. When Jesus steps in, your life is going to go back on, on track. 1980 on the back porch, I was messed up. I was doing drugs. I still drank and smoked after I got saved that night. Something happened that night. Something started changing in my life that night. Within three weeks, I knew something drastically has changed. I just didn't know what that was. So I did the first best thing I could think of, and I went to see my Uncle Rolf. I jumped in my 68 Mustang. I shot 20 miles across town, knocked on his door at the church where I knew he would be. You know, isn't it a blessing? A backslidden Southern Baptist preacher that would take your King James Bible out of your hand and put a New American Standard in his hand. I still knew where that guy would be all the time. He was at church. So I went to church, Rockford Lane Baptist Church, knocked on the door. The secretary came out, lady, I, I can't remember her name, I can't even remember her face. She came out and, and I said, hey, I'm, I'm Rolf Dorsey's uh, nephew. She goes, oh, Mike, how you doing? I said, really good. I said, I'd like to talk to Rolf. She said, okay. She went and talked to me. She said, hey, he's talking to somebody else. He'll come out and see you in just a second. I said, okay, that's fine. I can wait out here. She said, that's fine. So I'm sitting on the sidewalk. I still remember sitting there. And I'm looking up at the sky, and I'm like, what did you do? I said, you did something. I said, I don't know what you did. What did you do? And I start bawling. And I'm telling you, it was an uncontrollable ball. It was just uncontrollable. And I was crying and crying and tears running down my face and a load lifted off of me like I have never had anything lift off of me like that before. And it was like the Spirit of God or it might have been the Spirit of God actually coming down upon me. You know, uh, it was Tory or, or, uh, Tory or Tozer, one of the two, always talked about the second feeling and everybody always yelled and screamed about that. I said, no, I think there comes a point in your life where you get saved and then you really get saved. You're already saved. You're going to heaven for all eternity. But all of a sudden, you get a realization of what you did, and your life changes. Something grabs a hold of you, and now all of a sudden, you realize what you got. It's like grabbing a, a hold of a, a tiger's tail, man. <laughs> and that guy, that tiger's running all over the place, just flinging you all over the place. You ever seen those cartoons? That's the way it is, man. You got to hold. Never get a dog by the ears, because if you let go of one of them, you're going to get bit. And you can't let go of both of them at the same time, because he's going to bite this. I don't know what you do at that point. Maybe walk him over to Clifton and drop him off or something. But, but, boy, I got a hold of something that day that changed. I mean, that night on the back porch changed my life. Outside that church changed my destiny. When I walked in and Rolf told me I was saved, that thing clicked in my head and I never forgot it. You know what I think a lot of people do? And you forgot what happened to you. I don't have to defend anything, man. That's his to defend. I just got to be part of it. I just got to be part of it. You know what the maniac did? He was a sinner rescued. He was in his right mind. That sinner, that sinner, that, re, that maniac, when he found Jesus, he was able to deal with spiritual matters. Him and Jesus sitting there talking, having a great time. He could recognize, he was being recognized as different now. He wasn't the same as he was before. You know, anybody who meets Jesus is not the same as they are before. 
If you're the same as you were before you got saved, you better check out your salvation. I'm not saying you're lost. I'm saying there's something wrong somewhere. Because I am not the same. I met a lot of people that aren't the same before as they are afterwards. They got saved. Their lives changed. It just changed. And it was the right way to go. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. You know what this maniac was? He's a new creature. He's not the same as he was. He shifted from that side to that side. There was no middle ground. You notice here there's no middle ground. It wasn't that he moved here or he gradually moved here. No, 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 no. He went from here to there. That's a man who really met Jesus Christ. If I look at my Bible, man, I have to question sometimes, did we really meet Jesus Christ? Have you really met Jesus Christ? Or, or is he just an acquaintance of yours? I know him. I know him. He's my friend. 2 Corinthians 5 said, he said, therefore, if any man, any, any can be there, all inclusive, everybody. That's ladies too, by the way. Man, be in Christ. He is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Jesus walks up to a maniac. The worst condition you can find a person is the maniac. You can't get no worse. No, I don't think, I don't think if you put 10,000 devils in it, he'd have been any worse than he was. He was a maniac. Jesus walked right. Guess what? Jesus wasn't afraid to walk up to the maniac. What are you going to do? Nothing. <clears throat> I have all the cards. <laughs> you can't do anything. I hold the deck. You can't do anything. Why would I fear you? You know a lot of them, great peace have them to love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. Fear, fear is sin. I think you should be fearful, kind of, cautious. Maybe cautious is a better word. I think you should be, I've done a lot of stuff in my time that I could have died easily, easily. And I cautiously worked my way through processes to get me to a place. I'd run people out because I didn't want them to get hurt in case something happened. And I did that thing and it worked and I walked away from it just happy as I could be. Next day people say, How, what'd you do, man? How'd you do that? Nobody else could do that. How'd you do that? I said, well, listen, did that. I, I cautiously worked through that, but I wasn't afraid. It had to be done. You know what the problem is? A lot of times people just won't do what has to be done. They refuse. And then when somebody does something that has to be done, they get mad. Well, you're just too mean. No, man. You know what that maniac needed? That maniac needed Jesus in front of him. He didn't need him from afar. He needed him right in front of him. And he needed to see Jesus as he was. You know what the world needs? They need to see Jesus as he is. He is now King of kings and Lord of lords. He came into Jerusalem one time on a little donkey. He's coming in on a stallion the next time. He came in second or third class or coach the first time. He's coming in fully upgraded to first class. <coughs> He's going to have the best horse in the universe. You don't have to worry about that. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new, new, new. Sometimes we still live in the old times. We live in the old ways. The old ways aren't new. I like every day, man. I think every day with Lord is a every day with Lord is precious, man. You wake up in the morning, it's a precious. That's the only day you're gonna have with him today. After today, you, that day's gone. So you gotta wait till tomorrow to have another day with him tomorrow. I want today. Today's the day. I just like it. I just like getting up and trying to do stuff. These guys out here, all they want to do is work, 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 work. I want to work too. I want to get stuff done, but I want to go do other stuff too with Jesus. I want to just go do some stuff for Jesus. You say, oh, aren't you doing stuff for Jesus? Yeah, but see, sometimes you want to do what you want to do and not what necessarily the Lord wants to do. For the Son of Man has came to seek and save that which is lost. The maniac needed somebody, and Jesus came. Then, when Jesus was done, the maniac got a change of heart, got a change of mind. When the maniac was done, he became a soldier. Now, this, this is pretty much the rest of this. Is, here's the message coming in. He became a soldier, and he was recruited and re redirected. <clears throat> this man, when he got his mind right, when he was sitting there, all he wanted to do was be with Jesus. That's all he wanted to do. And he wanted to be around those that were Jesus. He was ready to get back in the boat with Jesus and his apostles and go out to sea. He just watched that storm out there. That maniac didn't care. I mean, he still probably carried some of his tendencies with him, the old maniacic ways. He still knew they were there. The devils were gone, so he had a clear thought in mind and heart and everything was good. And, uh, but he didn't really care. You know what he realized? If I'm with Jesus, I'm okay. And it doesn't matter where I'm at with Jesus. You know what he got is a real good dose of Jesus. He got a bigger dose than the apostles had. He got a dose. And God gave him a dose. The Lord Jesus Christ gave him a dose for a reason, for a reason. We're going to get that in just a second. 
Mark 5, 17 says, and they began to pray him. Then people in the city came out. Here's this guy all saved, or not saved, but all in his right mind, sitting there clothed and everything else. And all of a sudden, you know what the world's trying to do today is get you to take your clothes off. Jesus is trying to get you to put them on. Ah, I better stop. Um, you, there's something going on today, man, that nobody will have clothes on probably for. Uh, is the Super Bowl today? I am right, right? Or is it next Sunday? Okay, whatever. Mark 5, 17. And they began to pray him to depart out of their coast. And when he was come into the ship, he that had been possessed with the devil prayed him that he might be with him. Howbeit Jesus suffered him not, but said unto him, Go thy way, go home to thy friends, and tell them how great things the Lord had done for thee, and hath compassion on thee. There are some things, I'd like to say this, there are some things that will, there are some that will not understand what happened to you when you got saved. I got saved and my whole family thought I was crazy. Uh, amazing, it's an amazing thing. They didn't think I was too crazy before I got saved and I was doing all kinds of stupid stuff. But after I get saved and all that stuff kind of flakes off, they think I'm crazy. They tell me don't get too religious. You got to watch that Bible, man. That Bible will drive you crazy. They're probably right. I mean, I'm, I'm not the same as I was. All my friends left me. I had no friends anymore. They all left me. The only thing I had was the United States Navy. I shot out into the Navy, and I stayed there for 14 years. And I met Beth in nine years, and, and things just kept going that way, and it's been going that way for me ever since. But, you know, I, I, I realize that there's just a lot of people don't understand. Why? I'll tell you why. Because the guy was a raging inferno. He was, everybody didn't want to be around this person. Nobody wanted to be near this person. This person was inside just like a volcano ready to explode at any moment. He's not that way no more. He's not a maniac. He's a child of the king. He's not saved yet, but I bet you got that real shortly there afterwards. He's a raging inferno and everybody saw it. You know, everybody watches us and you are what you are and you can change that. But guess what? It's going to take some time for the, that thing to, to have an effect. He was full of the devil, and everybody knew it. <laughs> they might have not known he was the dead. The Lord knew he was full of the devil because he asked him, he said, what's your name? He said, legions, for we are many. And he told him, get out of him, and he got out. But everybody else knew he, something was wrong with him. He was rejected and feared because of that condition. You know, when you get to the place where people fear you or be, fear to be around you, it takes time for them to calm back down. They have to see that you're really who you say you are. I have a uh, brother, uh, Dr. Peacock, always tells me, he says, Elliot, you're not chief no more. I said, I know. I said, I really never wanted to be one anyways. But I said, man, you walk on a ship, and it's the captain's ship. It's his. It's not mine. It's his. I said, uh, Cam's Land or, or Comcare Group or whoever gave him this ship is his ship. And that man expects me to do certain things. He's, he, here's a list of things that he, he has given me to do that I know these are, my, these are my responsibilities on this ship. It isn't that I'm making this stuff up. This is what I'm supposed to do. And I said, if I'm going to have fun out here, I need to do everything I'm supposed to do and everything that anybody else needs I can help with. I'm a sailor. Then I should be a sailor. I thought, you know, when I got out there and I started, you know why I started a church? Because I thought a Christian ought to start a church. And an old lady one time says, when are you going to start a church? I said, why would I start a church? She goes, because you need to. And I said, okay, I'll tell you what. Next week, two weeks from now, I'll clean my garage. I will start a church in my garage. She thought I was lying. That was 18 years ago. My wife was sitting there in the, in the, when they was in the driveway. I was cutting a tree down in front of my front yard. I, I cleaned my garage out. I, we put a church in that garage, and the next thing you know, it got too many people in the garage, and we had to come over here. You say, how did that happen? I don't know. It just did. <clears throat> All of a sudden, we needed some money, and the money was there. People say, where do you get money? I don't know. People say, oh, you beg for money. I don't beg for money. You don't have to beg for money. The Lord just always provides it, man. When, you, when you're ready for it, guess what? It'll be there or you don't need it. So many times we try to do stuff for God when God never wanted us to do it. That maniac was sitting there, man. There are some that would just as soon have you out of sight than out of mind. Those, those first couple of men. They came and they seen this man sitting there and Jesus. And instead of saying, I want some of that. They said, could y'all just kind of leave? We done lost all of our pigs. 
Well, I can, uh, that's, that's upsetting enough. You lose all your bacon. That's pretty sad. But they, they lost everything, and instead of getting him to come to the city, I like those two men down the road to Dema- uh, Emmaus. They, they, they said, did not our hearts burn? Has your heart ever burned inside you when you're sitting there reading your Bible or you hear some preacher preach, and they're sitting there talking and, and listening, and, and you're like, yeah, man, intent. You know what I hate more than anything else is somebody sitting right next to me saying, oh, I've heard that before. I said, get out of here, man. Go somewhere else. I like, the, I like the old, old story. I like the song. I like our hymn books. That's the greatest book you'll ever find outside your Bible right there. That or All American Hymns or any one of the other ones got all these songs in them. These are some of the greatest things in the whole wide world. You know what they do? They change your heart. I can't sing. Learn. I can't read. Learn. Everybody else did. Pick the thing up, man. Start reading the thing. Start singing. Open it up. I need the, oh, yeah. I need thee every hour. It should be every second. Most gracious Lord, no tender voice like thine can peace afford. Man, it's a, it's a great book, man. Have you ever thought of it? Fight the good fight, rise up, is, is your all. You have long, you have long for sweet peace and for faith to increase and have earnestly, fervently prayed. But you cannot have rest or be perfectly blessed until all on the altar is laid. Is your all on the altar of sacrifice laid? Your heart does the spirit control. Well, I can't sing, man. My voice is gone. <clears throat> but does it? Does he have your heart or does somebody else got it? See, this maniac had somebody else. A whole bunch of other people had it. One man walked in one day and he gave it to Jesus. And guess what he wanted to do? He wanted to be with Jesus. That's all he wanted to do. But there's some that just can't handle that. They can't handle you getting excited. They can't handle me getting excited. I don't really care. (laughs) I'm perfectly happy with what I got, man. I've had it for 43 years, and I'll keep it to the day I die. And you ain't going to take it away from me. I can tell you how to get it. (laughs) But it's going to cost you. You're going to have to change your life. It isn't free. Salvation was. A relationship with Jesus Christ cost. Are you willing to pay? I was, man. I was tickled pink, man. I'd do anything he ever told me to do. If he tell me, you know what, I'll tell you what, he knows. He knows. He knows. If he came up and told me what to do, I'd do it. Or I'd die. He knows that. You know what he does? He keeps you right here. <laughs> I'm like, Lord, don't you know I'd go out and die for you? He goes, yeah, I know you would, but that's not what I want today. But today I want you right there where you're at. Just stay right there. <laughs> he goes, I know you would. He's tried. Have you ever been tried? He's done me a couple times and put me in positions, man, where I had to make some decisions that you just can't even believe. You can't believe. It's either him or them. And I'm like, forget them, man. <laughs> I said, if they throw me over the side of the ship, you own the sharks, man. They can't eat me unless you let them eat me. As a matter of fact, one of them might pick me up and take me home. I don't know. People worry about way too much stuff. Can God take care of you or can he not? You know what this maniac learned? That. In moments in his life, he met Jesus Christ, a man named Jesus. The man from Galilee, he met him. And it changed his entire life. Some people just can't handle it. They just, he has to, the maniac, he had a past that he had to work at to get people to accept him. You know, a lot of people cannot accept people sometimes. We've had a lot of people in and out of the church because they just can't come in and and they just feel like their sin is so great. Your sin's not that great, by the way. There's, the grace is greater than all our sin. There's nothing, there's nothing that anyone could do that Jesus Christ can't forgive. But the problem is, is will you forgive yourself? That's the problem. He had to learn patience to give other people time to do it. He had to show some things. You know that maniac was now not like he was before. That maniac was pretty smart. He's a pretty, pretty level-headed guy. And he could be reasoned with and talked to and everything else. But when he, I bet you when he went back to the city, they probably looked at him like, this guy's a maniac. And that guy had to do what he had to do. You know why you need a testimony? 
So people can look at you and after a while will talk to you. I've walked every job I've ever had. It took me about six months, seven months to get a testimony in that place. And at the end of that thing, people would call me in the office to talk to them about Jesus Christ while I'm working, while they're working. And they'd put the stuff aside. And we'd talk about Jesus for a few minutes, then we'd go right back to working again. I told you about that track out of, uh, out of Alexis Nexus that was in Building 10. And I was in Building 1. It was the greatest story ever told. It had no name on it. And they called me in the office. Phil Nessel calls me in there and says, would you quit passing these out? I'm like, Phil, how do you know that's me? He goes, you're the only one here that would do that. Steve, you wicked devil, why wouldn't you do that? <laughs> I mean, why would he call me in there and chew me out? You know what? That's your testimony. They know that you're the wacko nut that would do that. He did that with a smile on his face, by the way. And probably after I left his room, Dell Asbill probably said, hey, Ellie, come over and tell us about Jesus. I mean, I had a blast, man. I've run across maniacs. Keith Leekbert was a maniac. He's not a maniac anymore. <laughs> Keith was cool, man. I mean, he's cool as anything. I remember that day I got to go up and put my arm around and got down on my hands and knees, and, I was, and everybody's looking at me like, oh, no, volcano time. This whole place is going to blow up. I'm sitting there with my arm around him. Oh, Keith. And he's putting a battery in a, in a radio. And, and I'm like, man. And he looked like he was praying. I mean, he's down like this. He's getting a battery out underneath thing. And, and it's just a thought went in my head. I'm like, nah, yeah, no, yeah, no, good. Yes, do it. So I went over there. <laughs> and I got next to him and said, oh, Keith. He looks at me like, now, Keith was a wacko crazy nut. And I was too. But <laughs> I'm like, Keith. I said, man. I said, if everybody would pray when they put batteries in these things, you'd never have to put batteries in them ever again. He looked at me and said, you are out of your mind. <laughs> me and him got to be friends real quick. I was about the only one he'd ever let talk to him about Jesus Christ. Anybody else, he'd shut you right down. You say, why? I was just as much a maniac as he was. But I was on the other side. You know, I come to find out Keith was saved. What he was is he just fed up with Christianity as it was. He let, he let the world get a hold of him and just crush him as a Christian until he just balled up inside and no longer even cared about Jesus Christ anymore. That's wrong. That was Keith's problem. That wasn't nobody else's. He let somebody get someplace to destroy what he had. That's Keith's problem. That's not anybody else. Keith started coming out of that thing. It took some time, but it can happen. He had to accept that some would never overcome. Some never will get over what that maniac was. Some never will. But he was a different kind of a maniac than he was before. Now they think you're just crazy, man. You're, you're a religious fanatic is what you are. What the man had to do. Now, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, here's a message. A couple minutes and I will be done. Promise. What the man had to do to accomplish the request Jesus gave him. Jesus gave me a request. He said, depart. Let me find my verse here. Uh, Mark chapter 5. He, tell, he tells him, he goes, um, and when he, uh, and how be it Jesus suffered him not, and, and he said, go home to thy friends and tell them how great things the Lord had done for thee and hath had compassion on thee. The first thing we forget is what the Lord did for us. And he can do that for anybody. He could do that for anybody. But he had compassion on that maniac just like he had compassion on me on that night on the back porch. You know, he loved me so much that he ran me through a lot of stuff over the years before he got me to that porch that night. He, he wanted to make sure that I understood exactly what I was doing. And I didn't understand everything because it was all new. But the change that was getting ready, I like over in, in Matthew 7, says, cast out your pearls before swine. You know what he's saying? Don't, don't throw the thing before somebody's going to trample them. I remember reading that verse, and you know what the, the Holy Spirit just run through my head? Lost. Are you a pig? I'm like, oh, no, I'm not a pig. Are you a dog? I said, no. He said, I ain't going to give this to a dog or a pig. Are you either one of those? I said, no, I'm not a pig or a dog. He said, ask and you shall receive. Seek and you shall find. Knock and you shall be opened unto you. I'm like, knock, where it ask, where to seek, where? And boom, the book starts opening up. You know what the Lord wanted to do is he wanted to start a conversation. Then if you got the conversation, he wanted to make a change. What the man had to do, he had to overcome his past. I like, I like Paul. Paul's a... A uh, great orator. Paul, Paul talked about, I mean, tons and tons and tons of stuff. Paul, uh, a verse Paul, Paul said in Philippians 3.13, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things of which behind the past. 
You got to forget that stuff sometimes. You got to let that stuff go. Because we keep bringing it into the relationships we have today, and that don't belong there. Hey, man, I got saved. I did this. I did this. But that don't belong here today. I mean, you could talk about it, but it don't belong here. That lifestyle has nothing to do with this. I'm not that anymore. I was one day that. He said, uh, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the high calling of Christ. You know what, Paul, the title of this message, I'll give you the title of the message now. I didn't give it to you at the beginning. A new purpose, a plan to succeed. You know, when, when you, if you were a maniac and you got saved, uh, you're going to have to convince some people that you really did change. A lot of, these, a lot of times they'll say uh, jailhouse, we go to jails and they'll say jailhouse conversions. You got to really convince people. Your life should convince them. It should convince them. You got to overcome your past. He was a raging inferno. Everybody knew it. Am I on the right page? Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, he was full of the devil. Uh, he was rejected. I might have already read this page. He, uh, he had to accept the present. This is what Paul did. Paul was saying, forget those things which are past. He's in the present when he says that. I got to forget those things, and I got to worry about today. Hey, I might get stoned today. I might get flogged today. I might get thrown in jail today. This whole day is a whole new day. Why worry about what's in the past, man? Whole new stuff can happen today before anything. One day I get stoned, they drag me out, I come back to life. You never know what's going to happen. One day I get to go to heaven. I knew a man about 14 years ago, within the body, out of the body, can't tell such one called it the third heaven, to paradise. I get to go to heaven one day. You never know what the day may bring. Why would you live in the past? That's already gone. It's done. There's nothing you can do about it. Let it go, man. Move on. Think about it every now. Billy Graham said something I'll say in just a second. He was rejected. You got, you got to accept the presence, and then you got to look to the future. Uh, he is no longer a maniac. He shouldn't be acting like one. Uh, I got saved in 1980. Uh, I changed some things in my thinking. I'm not that anymore. I, I went back and talked to some of my friends. They don't want really nothing to do with me. They're really not my friends. But we don't think the same. Uh, what I like about Beth is we think the same, uh, which is kind of crazy, I guess. But anyways, it works. Uh, she thinks one way, I think one way, and she's a lady, and I'm a man, and so it changes. Uh, I can trust her immensely. I mean, I've, she's never given me a reason not to. Uh, but she was trained about the same way I was trained in a family, about the same way I was. Uh, her dad wasn't quite as bad as mine, but he was bad. And then I was trained over here, and then I got out of that stuff, and, and it took me nine years to change some things. And then we met, and, and we had so much stuff in common that that, that really wasn't the problem. Uh, the problem was just, could we live together? And we just had fun. Uh, I think if God gives you something, it ought to be fun. Uh, and, and I didn't know the, what the future held for me. I didn't really care. You know what I cared about was the day we got married. And you know what I cared about is the next day after we got married. I didn't care about the day we got married. The more I cared about the next day. And then I cared about the Monday where I had to get her back to Norfolk, Virginia, because I didn't care about the Thursday we got married and the Friday and Saturday and Sunday. I now care about just Monday. You know what you don't? You don't care about this. That's all in the past. It's nice to look at pictures. Pictures are okay. But I'm telling you what, I don't have time to go back and just sit there all day. I was telling somebody the other day, I always want to just be lazy. That's, that's my goal in life. I just want to be lazy. I just never found time to be lazy i got to do everything. If I could ever get everything done where I could just be lazy, I would be one of the best lazy people you've ever seen in your life. I just can't find the place where everything will get done that I can just sit back and do nothing. I don't know how you do it. <laughs> There's so much stuff to be done on a daily basis. How could you possibly not do it? I don't know, man. You know what? That's a stupid thing right there that takes your life. One second at a time, two or three hours at a time. Next thing you know, you look at all of it and you're, hey, if you got to answer a phone and you pick the thing up and you look at it and say, hey, so-and-so called me and huh, this and that and the other. Hey, yeah, maybe I'm, uh, do I want to take it? My phone rings at the house and I tell my wife, don't answer it. I almost kicked Mike out of church one day. My phone rang up there and he answered. He's bringing me out the phone. What did you do? You answered it. <laughs> now I got to talk to him. You said, is that what you said? Pretty much what I said. Well, yeah, that's... He had to overcome, he had to accept his present, he had to look to the future. He's no longer a maniac. It doesn't matter what others think about in their mind. It only matters what Jesus thinks of you. That's all that matters. His service was to God and man, not to the world and flesh. He changed. He had to look to the future. That's what my future is. He was given a great commission by Jesus Christ. Each one of us are given that same thing, by the way. And if he gave it him, 
he must have known he could carry it out. What can stop you? Exactly what can stop you from serving Jesus Christ? Only you. You are the only one. Like Smokey the Bear said, you are the only one that can prevent forest fires. No, you're the only one that can prevent you starting a forest fire. Because if I don't ever start a forest fire, how come California is still burning down? It's because it does. Mark 5.20 says, and he departed and began to publish in the De- Decapolis how great things Jesus had done for him, and the men did marvel. Now, I'll say this, just about done, two minutes, maybe five or 15. Uh, the maniac had no education. He just met Jesus. The maniac was a maniac, and now he's saved. Now he's, he's in his right mind. He's clothed. He was given a great job, and the Lord trusted him with that, what little he had. If you've ever met Jesus Christ, you have more than the lost world will ever have. You have all the goods you need to give them. The problem is, is the joy in your life and the peace that God gives us isn't evident and they won't see it. You know what this man had? Peace of God and joy. He wanted to go with Jesus. Jesus said no. You know what the guy did? He obeyed. He met Jesus shortly and learned immediately how to obey another man. I'm like, what a thing, man. I said, I don't have a problem with that. I think it's the greatest thing in the world. You know, if you're going to get, so I told somebody this the other day, if, if you put a sailor in a rowboat out at sea, he is nothing. If you put a sailor on a destroyer, I call it a brain destroyer, and you put him out to sea, the destroyer can do only so much thing, and then they're, they're really limited on what they could do. You put that destroyer in a battle group with 28 other ships and four submarines, and you got a force worth reckoning with that can just about blow any planet, any, any country off the face of this planet. That's what your Navy is. Now, you hear me tell, that's what, that, that's what the Navy is. Uh, brother uh, uh, oh, uh, Joe Harris gave me a, a, a hat and says, United States Navy, we own the seas. That's a fact. That, that is fact. That is not even, that isn't even debatable. If you know anything about what your country has spent its money on, that, that phrase isn't even debatable. There's more money spent. You ought to go to Norfolk and just look at the ships on the pier front down there. And God's got, those things are all out there to protect you so you can sit and do whatever you want to do. Brother, we got the opportunity there. You think we're going to get to heaven and the Lord's not going to say, I put you in the greatest nation on the face of this planet? The richest nation on the face of this planet. You're the poorest people on the face. They're, they're dying to get into this country. Why do you think they're doing that? And you sit there and spend your whole life belly aching about what? You had every opportunity afforded to you, given to you, and what did you do with it? The Bible's full of people with past. Noah had a past. Jacob had a past. His sons had a past. Samson had a past. Children of Israel had a past. They were in the wilderness for 40 years and 40, 40 years and 40 nights. <laughs> 40 years and 40, 40 years, just 40 years. And they belly ached the whole time. God gave me oh, this manna, this, this manna, we have to eat this manna. Well, it's better than eating nothing. I know about that one. David had problems, had a past. God still used him. The woman at the well had a past. The Lord talked to her. Zacchaeus, the wee little man, had a past. Apostles had a past. You got a past. Don't ever think you don't have a past. The past will destroy you if you live in it. I like what Bill, uh, Billy Graham said. Billy Graham messed up bad, but I like Billy Graham. He, in his older days, he said some good stuff. He says, don't be bound by the past and its failures, but don't forget its lessons either. You know, it's a lot of it. You got a past, and you let that past keep you down. There's an altar up here, man. We got a few minutes here. Brother uh, Adam, come up here and sing a song. Did you let your past get to you? And your, your past should be there, and it should be something. I did that once. I don't want to do that again. I'm going I'm I'm to veer off of that. But to live back in that past, there's no place back there. It wasn't, you didn't need to be there to start with, and you don't need to be there now. You know where you're at? You're in the present looking toward the future. And you know what the future is? It's Jesus Christ. And it's heaven. And it's going to glory. And it's trying to get somebody else there. And trying to help somebody the next step of the way. That's all it is. And you, you sit there and say, look, I'm gonna, you, sometimes you got to suck it up. Sometimes you got to take the hit. Who cares? Jesus took it for you. The only one that could open the book 
The only one that could un and loose the, the, the strings on that book in heaven and open those pages and commence what was getting ready to happen was Jesus Christ, the only person in eternity that could do that. And what did he do for you? He saved your soul. And you like the maniac. You know what he did for that maniac? He said, yeah, you come with me. But coming with me isn't going to be as fun as you going out by yourself. You don't need nobody else. You need just you, need just you, you and me. That's all we need. And you already got me. He says, you know what you need to do? You need to go out and you need to start telling some people about me. You know what y'all need to do? You need to go out. Let me ask you a question. Are you out there telling somebody about you, about him, with the right heart? Have you got the peace of God that passes all understanding? Have you got the joy in your soul that you had when you got saved? Or is something taking that thing away? You know what David said? Take not the Holy Spirit from me. Return, re, uh, restore unto me the joy of my salvation, of thy salvation. He said, Lord, give me that joy back so I can skip through there. When he came into the city and he was bringing the Ark of the Covenant in, he was, they said he was half naked. And he's just dancing in front of them. I don't dance. I'm not going to dance. I don't care what I I'm not going to do that in the parking lot out here to get anything. Forget it. It ain't going to happen. Uh, but you know what? I'm sitting there going, you know what David was doing? Jumping up and down, having a shouting match. You know his best friend, Jonathan? Boy, they'd probably do the same thing, man, just shouting and screaming and having a good time. Because you know what? They were serving God. Brother, we got the greatest thing this planet's ever saw was Jesus Christ. We ought to be the happiest people around. Father, thank you for your blessings this morning. Lord, thank you for that maniac that's no longer a maniac. And Lord, I don't know what his ministry was after that or his success, but Lord, you gave him something. You entrusted him with something. You put a pound in his hand and said, hey, go out there and do something with it. Uh, Lord, I'd, I'd, it would be a blessing to get to heaven and see cities uh, converted because of that man, groundwork laid because of that man and the joy. Uh, Jesus could easily let him gone with him, but then he'd have been like Mary at the foot of Jesus all the time and never get anything done. Lord, I just pray for our church today, Lord, that you'd bless us. Lord, that you'd uh, work in our hearts, Lord, that uh, you'd restore unto us the joy of our salvation. And, Lord, that others would see that and they'd see the change that's in our lives, Lord, and that uh, we can win some souls. Father, it's still time. You haven't come back yet. Uh, we still have plenty of time to do it. Bless now, Father, and we'll praise you in Jesus' name. Bless the, the uh, altar call, Father, and we'll praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's go ahead and stand.